Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Q&A for Brown Hair Street Butterfly Surveyors. Um, I'm Lindsay Marn. I'm from Devon Wildlife Trust and work in the Saving Devon's Treescapes team. And I'm really delighted that we've got Max Anderson from Butterfly Conservation with us here tonight. And Max will introduce himself in a moment, and he's the expert. The reason that we're here um, is because I'm conscious that once we've perhaps got together for a group training event, you're all out there surveying and making your own observations on what you're finding and perhaps raising questions about what you're finding and you know just asking questions about what brown hair streaks are up to and there's not many opportunities for us to get together as a community of brown hair streak interested parties and to have a discussion about that and to ask those questions and to figure out what the answers may be and hear from the experts at butterfly conservation so that's the reason we're all here tonight. And I thank you very much for, for all of your efforts in your recording so far. I'm just going to say a few things in general to the introduction to the Saving Devon's Treescapes project, just to set this work in context. So Saving Devon's Treescapes is a five-year project, which is led by Devon Wildlife Trust on behalf of the Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum. And it's a partnership project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, One Tree Planted and a number of other funders. We are just over halfway through the five years of our project. So we will run until the end of March 2026. So there's the rest of this Brown Hair Street survey season to go, plus two more after that. And then we'll be looking um, for the legacy for, for all of the good work that we've started to move forward beyond that date. But the reason that we exist is because of ash dieback disease and the fact that ash is being significantly impacted, not just in Devon, but across the UK. And essentially, we're a tree planting um, project. So we are looking to make the treescapes of our county more resilient for the future to face future challenges, whether those are other tree diseases or climate change and the challenges that that might pose to our trees in the future. But alongside of that, we have a species monitoring program, and that's my role. I run our species monitoring side of things. And brown hair streaks are one of the species that we've chosen to focus on for that, along with the, running the Devon Bat Survey, monitoring lichens, and supporting the RSPB cell bunting project, and the Devon Harvest Mouse project, um, and also recording notable trees across the county. So there's six things really that we are we are helping to record. And all of those species have been chosen because of their preference for ash trees or their reliance on our treescapes and healthy treescapes more generally. So that's the reason that we've chosen those species. But tonight we're here to talk about brown hair streaks. And so I'm going to hand over to Max now, who can introduce himself very um, well, I'm sure, and, and give us a bit of an introduction to the species. So thank you very much, Max. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm delighted to be here um, and really provide an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions you have about the experiences that you've had uh, along the way so far, or if you're new to this, any questions that would be really useful for you to have the answer to, if we have the answer to them, um, that is. I'm going to quickly share a presentation. Hopefully it won't take too long, really, um, but I'm just going to get through some of the basic stuff just for anybody that is very new to the subject um, and really try and fill in some gaps and hopefully address some questions that might come about um, anyway. So I'll crack on and then towards the end of this, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand and uh, we can we can do that however is convenient. But also I've, I've left my email address at the bottom of this slide and I'll be on the final slide as well. So please, if you've got any questions about brown hair streaks and their ecology and, and monitoring and habitat preferences and management, then Please feel free to drop me uh, an email. I'll be happy to have a chat. Um, so let's crack on. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, I'm going to really start off by introducing the brown hair streak. Uh, I'll be quite brief through this, but as Lindsay said, we will record this. It is being recorded, so it'll be online. And if you'd like to track back through some of this, then that's uh, that's up to you. Um, and you can take it a bit slower then. So the brown hair streak is quite an elusive adult butterfly. Um, it's very difficult to see as an adult. It spends most of its time at the tops of trees or in amongst uh, dense vegetation. Um, it often gathers around ash trees. Um, occasionally some other trees are used. Um, we don't exactly know why it's ash trees that are favored, but we typically refer to these as master trees. Males tend to congregate 
at the tops of these trees and form territories. Um, and it's at the bottom of the trees, if we have uh, nice bits of blackthorn coming through, that the females will often lay their eggs. And that's what we tend to look at in terms of, of good habitat. Um, the species tends to form quite small colonies at low densities, but they're not too bad at dispersing as far as we understand, but it's not a subject that we're, we fully understand at any great depth anyway. Um, the females tend to like to lay their eggs on uh, blackthorn, so prunus spinosa, uh, but occasionally they will also lay their eggs on other species of prunus, uh, other types of cherry, um, uh, quite popular as well, but the, the main host uh, plant for brown hair shriek is prunus spinosa, blackthorn. Um, the main habitats that you'll tend to find these in, uh, hedgerows are particularly popular, uh, scrubby patches, woodland edges and woodland rides, basically anywhere where you've got a good amount of, of blackthorn um, and some other suitable conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about habitat in a minute. Now, there is a lot of concern about brown hair streaks. While they are not, not um, comprehensively, um, we don't really understand the species very comprehensively. We've got a good understanding to some degree, but there's still a lot that we still really want to understand about this species so we can try and reverse some of the declines that we're seeing and some of the uh, reductions in its uh, occupancy of certain sites and its distribution across the UK. And it's mostly found uh, in the south of the UK, but we're incre increasingly seeing it a little bit further north. And there are suggestions that climate change might be uh, contributing towards these observations. The life cycle. So the, the adults are, are on the wing from around about July through to September and often into October. And increasingly now we're seeing later and later records of most of our butterflies. Uh, the eggs, uh, females will tend to lay their eggs in August. The, the males tend to emerge as adults earlier, and then the females are a week or two behind. And so typically we tend to see egg laying going on in uh, in August uh, through to September and October. Um, and the eggs will be visible from uh, mid-August, I'd say. Uh, they're usually laid singly on, on blackthorn, uh, but occasionally in more um, uh, in more numbers. The, uh, the larvae develop in the egg over winter before they hibernate and then they emerge in, uh, in spring. Uh, they'll begin to feed on the buds of blackthorn you can see a little picture uh, just here uh, that shows some feeding damage or a caterpillar has gone into the bud and they'll stay there for a short while until they emerge uh, as a, a slightly larger caterpillar in a different instar. And then they'll start to feed on the leaves of the blackthorn and eventually uh, they will pupate. And we don't really understand a lot about where they pupate, but the suggestion is that it will pupate on the ground and perhaps they have a strong association with ants um, that relates to this. Uh, the larvae are predated by a number of different things, but again, it's not something that we fully understand. Um, we do have some evidence to show that they're, they're predated by um, small mammals. Things like mice and shrews will hunt out caterpillars and uh, the, the chrysalis. Uh, but birds will also feed on young caterpillars and also eggs. Uh, and also things like sp spiders and harvestmen are um, fantastic predators of many of our lepidoptera and undoubtedly going to have an impact on them as well. The main habitats for brown hair streaks, uh, usually hedgerows are quite popular uh, as long as they have a good amount of canopy around or nearby so that the males can occupy uh, them as master trees. Uh, field corners are particularly good. Anywhere where blackthorn is allowed to encroach into the, uh, into the field, not be restricted um, to the actual margin itself. Uh, so small scrubby patches can be quite good, uh, as well as woodland edges and woodland rides uh, that have good amounts of um, uh, blackthorn in. So here we've got an example of a hedgerow uh, that's got some suckering growth that's coming from the margin, which is ideal. Uh, that's the sort of habitat that we want to, to encourage farmers or landowners to, to allow to thrive. But the blackthorn is allowed to encroach a little bit into the margin of the field. And that's where you get this, this young suckering growth that is often favoured by females. And we've got a good example here. This is from Ludwell Valley Park in Exeter. Uh, and this is some pretty good habitat for brown hair streaks. We can see we've got some dense blackthorn in the center of the photo, as it, as it comes towards the edge of the field, um, it gets younger and younger. And then we've got very young sucker and growth that's emerging uh, on the edge there. And that's ideal. That's where the females are more likely to, to lay their eggs. Also, woodland edge um, can be a bit more uh, wild than, than uh, field margins of arable and uh, recreational fields. Uh, but often we, we try and encourage people to, to, uh, to manage blackthorn on a rotation. So that only a fraction of the entire habitat is managed in any one year, and that reduces the impact on any populations 
that are present. So we typically advise something between three and five year rotations. So only a maximum of a third of the entire uh, bit of habitat or blackthorn is, is managed in, uh, in any one year. Or sometimes just a car park, you know, it, it's a it's a funny story, really, that a lot of butterflies, while we talk about our nature reserves and really rare bits of habitat, often you'll be surprised that it just takes a little bit of scrub in a car park to allow um, a population of brown hair streaks to thrive and persist. Um, and this is just one example uh, in, in Sussex. I spent some time living in Sussex and this is a, a car park of a cricket ground, um, a tiny patch of a blackthorn coming from a just a, a, field, a field margin. Um, and of some fantastic numbers of brown hair streaks there. So even if you're not too sure where to look, you'd be surprised that even in your back gardens or um, the, the edge of a, a car park, you'd be surprised where you might find brown hair streaks. They're quite resilient at times. I've talked about suitable habitat, but unsuitable habitat is equally important to talk about. And flailing of hedges is something that uh, is cause for concern, particularly when it's done on, on, a, on a large scale. Uh, it's not only damaging for brown hair streak, it can be damaging for a, a wide range of species. You know, a lot of birds rely on dense hedges uh, in order to nest and to feed and to shelter. And so we're, we're removing, you know, huge quantities or huge proportion of suitable habitat in, in one fell swoop. Uh, and so it's worth keeping an eye out for unsuitable habitat. Uh, not to say that we shouldn't survey it because it'd be useful to survey unsuitable habitat just to reaffirm that the habitat is not good for brown hair streaks because... The, the eggs are being um, destroyed in the process of flailing. So why is it that we monitor eggs? Well, as I mentioned in the first slide, brown hair streak adults are incredibly elusive. They spend most of their time out of reach at the tops of canopies, which makes them really difficult to survey. You know, in contrast to some of our grassland generalist species, things like meadow browns and, um, and ringlets and other relatively common and widespread species, the brown hair streak is, is a very fast flyer. It's elusive. It's difficult to find. It, it's only really uh, active at particular times of day. Um, and so it really presents challenges when it comes to monitoring. The eggs, however, are very conspicuous uh, or rather conspicuous compared with uh, many other eggs. They're, they're laid on blackthorn and they tend to contrast quite, quite, uh, quite a lot with the, the stem or the branch of blackthorn you can see in this image. The egg actually stands out quite significantly here. And this is quite a typical view that you'll have as you're walking around surveying. I'm sure many of you will, will have seen this um, when you're doing your surveys. So one of the first questions that might be useful to some of you is how do we how do you figure out what blackthorn is and what isn't blackthorn? So there's a few tips here that might be quite useful. I've got a comparison image here that compares hawthorn on the left and blackthorn on the right. So the first thing to mention is that blackthorn is typically at a distance, at least. It's got this bluish, blackish, grey tinge to it um, that hawthorn doesn't have. Hawthorn is typically a sort of shiny brown colour. Um, another thing is that um, blackthorn tends to have longer thorns compared with hawthorn. You can see that from this image. These individual thorns are a lot longer than the small um, thorns that we've got on this uh, this hawthorn branch. You can also see the shape of the actual twig itself. It might be a little bit subtle, but you can detect a sort of zigzag, a slight zigzag in the shape of the uh, the branch on the hawthorn on the left, whereas the blackthorn tends to be a lot straighter. There is a slight zigzag, but it's not um, as obvious as it is in hawthorn. So that's something to note as well. Um, one of the key things is that on, on blackthorn, the, the buds often grow on the spines itself. And you can see here on the, the blackthorn, we have buds growing on the spines, whereas with hawthorn, the, the buds and the leaves always grow from the base of the spines um, or the thorns and, and never along the thorns themselves. Uh, when it comes to the leaves, uh, you can see the leaves here on these images. The, these are hawthorn leaves. They are heavily lobed, so they've got a lot of these lobes. Um, and that's in contrast to, to blackthorn, which has uh, sort of oval-shaped leaves with serrated edges. Um, they're finely toothed. Um, whereas the hawthorn, as I mentioned, are heavily lobed. So that should be a quite a definitive um, characteristic to identify between the two. Something to mention as well is often when we, we come across blackthorn, in certain habitats, black, blackthorn can develop um, a lot of lichen or uh, different accumulations of things that make it um, quite difficult to see. And, and so you've got some examples here on the right. Uh, we've got a few that are very, very heavily lichenized, and we've got a sort of scale of 
but towards the top, we've got very heavily lichenized and, and towards the bottom, uh, I've got no lichen uh, growing on them at all. And so we want to try and really, when we're surveying, we want to try and avoid these top three. Um, and when you're monitoring uh, and doing the survey re report and the forms, uh, it will ask you to try and categorize the type of blackthorn that you've been surveying. And this is the sort of ID guide for this. So A to C are the top three that are, um, are very um, heavily lichenized. Um, also includes things like recently trimmed. So just uh, pay attention to the descriptions when it comes to defining the different types of blackthorn that you've been uh, monitoring. And what we're really looking for is more of the younger, less lichenized uh, bare branches um, that should should be more suitable for egg laying the females. They're typically between one, two, three years old um, are less likely to be occupied by lichen. Um, and that should be um, a good indicator for, for suitable egg laying. So when it comes to monitoring the eggs, usually the eggs are located typically at the fork. So we can see here in this image, we've got an egg that's just um, on, on one of the forks next to one of the, the thorns on this, um, on this sucker. Uh, typically they're laid singly, like we can see in these three images, but occasionally they're laid in doubles or even more. Um, they're also occasionally laid on a scar between uh, the next year's growth. So um, over a period of a year, the blackthorn will develop a scar where the next year's worth of growth uh, emanates from. And occasionally you will see uh, eggs laid on these scars. Usually it's where there is um, uh, almost a physical barrier between the continuation of the branch and um, whatever it is that that meets, whether that's a bud or a scar or a thorn. It usually requires a, a physical barrier for the female to lay the egg on a shelf, um, often referred to in the literature. And in terms of where we want to search, ideally between sort of half a meter and 1.5 meters is, is fine, but I would encourage people to look elsewhere as well. I, I've found them below five centimeters and I've also found them way above uh, two meters. So if you can, then I would encourage you to look in other places. Um, I would probably focus on suckering growth as it's quite accessible and relatively straightforward uh, to survey. And it, you usually increase your chances by looking at younger growth uh, on the tree or on the um, on the blackthorn that's coming from the uh, the margins, the suckering growth. Uh, so, yeah, the suckering growth is, is favoured. And if you've got hedges that are managed in a rotation and you're constantly or consistently monitoring year after year after year, you might want to target those that have been managed uh, a year or two previous because um, that will provide suitable conditions to allow young blackthorn to come through. And that's the sort of sucker growth that we're focused on that's optimal for females. Generally, sort of 90%, we say, of brown hair streaks tend to prefer the younger blackthorn and they will avoid mature blackthorn. So if we have a uh, very thick stemmed blackthorn, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, more than five centimeters in diameter, it's, it's very unlikely that you're going to have anything um, on a majority of the uh, of that individual plant. Uh, perhaps on some of the, the very, very young growth on that plant, you may get some eggs, but it's far less likely uh, to, to occur. Uh, and also, as I've mentioned, anything with lichen on is, is also less likely uh, to be suitable for egg laying. The, the females and the males both prefer sunny south-facing edges. So if you've got hedgerows that are east to west running, um, then I would focus my efforts on the south side. But also it's important to, to note that it's useful to have data for surveys that take place on the north side, because that, that again, that reaffirms this idea, if we have data uh, for that, that we don't tend to get as many eggs that are laid on north facing uh, hedges or north facing aspects. Um, and ideally we want these habitats to have a good canopy or some mast trees within a reasonable distance of the, the blackthorn, because that's where males are likely to set up territories. Um, we also want to try and avoid blackthorn over about seven years old. So as I said, um, you know, five centimeters is a reasonable target to aim for. Anything less than that should be pretty good or reasonably good, but it's it's difficult to be certain without seeing it with your own eyes, really. So give it a, give it a try, but anything over sort of seven years might be less suitable. Um, and a final point to note there is that um, most of our records in the UK are found below 200 meters elevation. So if you're going up onto the top of Dartmoor, uh, you might be less likely to find any eggs than you are towards the bottom of or towards the edges where the elevation is lower. Um, although that's not um, definitive, there are some records that are above 250, 300 meters, 
but if you want to increase your chances of finding records, they're likely far, far more likely to be at lower elevations than at high. Uh, what else can we find on blackthorn? So as, as well as brown hair streak eggs, we're very unlikely, and you know, it might be because of a release that we find something like black hair streak eggs. Um, they're nowhere near us. The closest populations will be uh, Oxford. So not something that I would be too concerned about. And brown hair streak eggs are, are pretty uh, distinctive compared to anything else that you're likely to find. Um, we've got a few different moths that you're also potentially going to come across. Uh, so green brindle crescent lays eggs on blackthorn as well as lackey vaporer feathered thorn uh, and scalloped oak. Uh, but the one that you're most likely to come across during the winter, I would say, is blue bordered carpet moths. And these are the ones at the bottom left here. Um, they should be quite easy to di differentiate between brown hair streaks, but obviously when, when you look at them up close, um, that's easy. But when you're looking at them with the naked eye, it might be slightly difficult. But overall, the key uh, feature to, to pick up on is brown hair streak eggs are perfectly round and the, uh, the blue bordered carpets are almost like a tic-tac shape. Uh, and that should help when um, if if that presents an issue. So one of the last things I wanted to talk about was just about avoiding uh, adverse weather conditions. So we don't want people to go out surveying when the weather is is really bad. So if you've got really heavy wind or strong winds, then try and avoid going out. Um, ideally, we want to try and survey between November and February, but you can survey in October. Um, although note that blackthorn doesn't really shed its leaves until late October, early November, typically. So it might be more problematic when there are leaves on the trees, but that hasn't stopped me in the past. So if you think you can go out there and do that, then that's absolutely fine. Um, ideally do it during the day. You're going to really struggle at night and it's not very safe. So please stick to daylight hours when you're surveying. And of course, uh, health and safety stuff. Try and do this in, in groups or if, if there's more than one of you, that would be great. Um, obviously take care when you're surveying along roads and lanes. If you can wear a high vis jacket, that's really, really useful. Uh, one thing I would recommend people to do is, is to wear protective eyewear. Uh, I've had a few close calls in the past, and I know blackthorn can be very, very dangerous. So please be careful when um, when handling blackthorn. The thorns can be very painful, and uh, there is a real risk of infection if you break the skin. So please be careful with that one. So we've got here a brown hair streak egg up close. Really beautiful egg with a very fine detail, lots of different gaps. And uh, this is a really fresh egg that's been laid. And that's not always the case. Sometimes you might have uh, trouble identifying it because it doesn't look as typically pristine as this. So I've just got a few images here that might help um, just to raise a few questions. If anybody had any questions about how they look and how to differentiate them from other things, hopefully a few images that follow can help. So. This is a scale for reference. So this is my thumb. I haven't got a huge thumb. Um, I've got a normal sized thumb. So that should uh, look uh, pretty normal to everybody else. Um, so this is two eggs and yeah, they are very small, but they are quite uh, conspicuous. They do stand out quite strong against the blackthorn itself. Um, something I would recommend for people to do <clears throat> is to bend the blackthorn upside down. Often the females will lay their eggs on the underside of the thorn. So at the very end of the blackthorn, if you grab hold of that and bend it down, it, it's quite a malleable plant. So you can bend it down and look on the underside of the thorns. Uh, I, I know myself, I've gone back and, and done this and found an additional few eggs that I'd missed previously. So don't be afraid of, of holding it. Obviously be careful of the thorns, but grab the top. The top of the plant tends to be free of thorns and just bend it down. That often helps. They're usually laid on a fork. So you can see here, this one's nestled in on, on a fork of a bit of blackthorn, but that's not always the case and occasionally they're just laid right in the middle of the stem. Um, so don't necessarily restrict all of your um, searching to junctions or forks on the tree. Uh, feel free to check the stems as well. I would tend to check the first sort of, I don't know, 30 centimeters to a meter of a plant. Uh, any lower is less likely, but um, it's still worth checking as well. The eggs can also develop uh, different colors because of either algae or lichen that's growing on the tree uh, or the plant. Um, so bear in mind that sometimes they can be a uh, slightly different color. They're also not only likely to pick up algae, but they're also likely to pick up damage. So this one has lost a lot of the, um, the fine detail on the, the egg surface itself. And it's also accumulated um, some lichen or some algae there that's developed. So that's, that's a remarkably well camouflaged egg. 
Um, but, you know, occasionally we will miss some of these things and that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, but just something to bear in mind is occasionally they will pick up damage uh, and as well as lichen and maybe some algae as well. I did mention they are most likely to be laid singly. They're not, not infrequently laid in doubles. It depends on the density of adults that are in a particular, particular area. And this, these are photos that I took when I was in Sussex in that same location that I took that photo in the car park. And there's a remarkably high density of, of adults here. And it's not, it's not uncommon to find doubles, triples, and even quadruples uh, there as well. So just bear that in mind. It might throw you off if you see more than two. Um, but, you know, if you have a hand lens or magnifying glass to, to check um, up close, that will be very, very definitive there. As I mentioned, it's not just worth looking between half a meter and 1.5 meters. Also look close to the ground. Again, my normal size finger here is about five centimeters from the ground. You know, this is not, it's not very common to find this, um, but just to note that they do go to this sort of height um, if if it's appropriate. So something to bear in mind. And also way above, um, way above two and a half meters. I've seen them above two and a half meters on a few, few different occasions at different sites. Um, so worth bearing that in mind as well. These aren't fantastic photos, but they do illustrate the difference between the brown hairstrick eggs and these uh, blue bordered carpet moth eggs. Uh, they are these sort of tic-tac round um, shape, uh, very different to the, the almost spherical um, brown hair streak eggs. So that should help. Um, and they, they're quite often laid doubly. Um, I know it at least. A lot of the eggs that I find for blue bordered carpets tend to be laid in doubles. Um, so something worth bearing in mind. Again, if you could bring a hand lens, that's always very, very useful and recommended. And that'll be very helpful for uh, confirming these sort of things. Something else to note is that brown hair streaks occasionally will lay, or in my in my experience, more than occasionally, will, will lay eggs quite close to each other. And so if you do find an egg, it's always worth investigating around uh, the, the, the location that it's laid an egg to see if there are any, any further eggs there as well. So you can see here, I've got two eggs within about five or 10 centimeters of each other. Um, and yeah, this is not uncommon. So I would recommend for people to do this uh, if they do find one. And the final thing I want to do is just share this video. I don't know if it's going to play very smooth, but I'll see how it goes. But this just tries to hopefully just illustrate um, the process that I went in finding uh, some black uh, brown hair streak eggs. Uh, this October it was, so while the leaves are still on the blackthorn, so I've got an example there of using my hand lens to find the egg, and we can see where it is in its context. So this one was about 1.5 meters above uh, the ground. Uh, we've got some nice young growth here as well, where there were some eggs as well. Uh, and in this site, I did have an egg about two and a half meters ground. So this nice tiny little patch uh, of blackthorn, and this was in the, on the Killerton Estate in the, in the, the National Trust Estate in Devon. So a really good opportunity to find some eggs there that had never been recorded before in that location. So lots of exciting things to, to really discover about this species. Final thing I want to just say is obviously if, if nobody's ever surveyed before and you'd like to get involved, um, take a look at the Devon Treescapes website uh, for some of the information that you need in terms of what to record. There is an instructional video online as well that my colleague uh, Jenny Plackett um, had put together and Lindsay can share the, the details of that and share the link for that if anybody would like to uh, to look at that. That's on YouTube as well. If you're interested in doing a survey, please do get in touch with uh, with Lindsay. Um, and once you're finished and you've done your, uh, your surveys, please do submit your forms um, and just let Lindsay know when you've completed the surveys so that we can update the records and, and go from there. Because it's very useful data to have, uh, can inform some really useful questions that we still don't have the answer to. Uh, so it's incredibly valuable work that's being done on the ground. Right, so that's, that's all I had to say. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give a few minutes for people to ask some questions. I'll, I'll check the chat. Uh, we can see if there are any, um, any additional questions. Again, my email address is on there. So if anybody wants to get in touch, please do get in touch with any questions. I'd be happy to chat with anybody about anything that I've discussed here or anything that I haven't covered as well. That's great, Max. Thank you very much. There are a few questions that have come into the chat already, and I'm sure people 
are still thinking about forming their questions and a few more will appear. Um, I'll maybe talk just before we finish a little bit more about the recording um, process and I'll just show you our online recording platform for that and take you through very quickly, just take you through the recording form so you can see hopefully how straightforward it is. Um, I've got a few other questions that have been sent to me in advance as well, Max. So I'm um, so happy to, to talk those through. But one that occurred to me as you were showing such amazing photographs and thank you for such a, a helpful refresher and, and introduction is how, what are the tips for taking good photographs? Because I personally have done, this is my third season of surveying now and I'm still struggling to take very clear photographs despite having what I thought were quite reasonable bits of, of photographic equipment. Yeah, it's a good question. It, it can be quite tricky with this. I think there's two approaches to take. Um, I've found most success with with my uh, my own uh, SLR camera. I've got a mirrorless camera that I use and I have a macro lens for that. I'd recommend people to get a macro lens if you want to take pictures of things that are very small and up close. Um, do some Googling and figure out what the best lenses for your, your gear are. Uh, that's probably my strongest recommendation. But there is a, a budget friendly version of that and that is to use um, your hand lens and your mobile phone camera if you uh, if you have a mobile phone, which I suspect most of you do, um, I it is quite problematic. It's quite tricky to do. Logistically, it's quite difficult. But if you hold the hand lens very close to the camera lens, uh, you can actually find some success in doing that. You might need somebody to hold the branch in a in a, in a good position for you. Uh, but I've I've had uh, I've had to bit, have a bit of practice to be able to get that down to a T. So it takes a bit of practice. But the majority of photos that I've shared in in this are taken with. Uh, a mirrorless camera and a macro lens. Thank you. Um, do you think you could answer a couple of these questions here about um, either scrub clearance or hedge management and sort of what are what are the best practices for managing hedges for brown hair streaks, but also for other wildlife? I think I think one thing serves more than one purpose. Absolutely. I think a lot of the approaches that we take for something like the brown hair streak will will um, provide success or benefits to a lot of other species. I think the, the the main thing that I would recommend for people to do is is to manage their hedges or e even scrub patches that they have in a rotation. So in any given year, you're not wiping out the entire uh, the entirety of the habitat and you're only dealing with, let's say, a third or a quarter or a fifth of the entire habitat that you have. So we divide a hedgerow or a, a field margin into five or six or seven sections. We might perhaps decide to, to manage only one of those every four or five years. Um, and in that way, what we're doing is we'll coppice the, the blackthorn down to the ground, and then we will get suckering growth that will come through that is going to be more, more suitable, <clears throat> more suitable for, um, for brown hair streak. The hedge itself, we don't want to blitz that right down to the ground um, we can trim that back and allow that to uh, retain the, the right shape that we need um, but if there's any growth that's coming through from the margin we want to try and encourage that if possible uh, to encroach a little bit uh, beyond that that margin itself and that's the, as I've said a few times it's that suckering young growth that, that is beneficial but that approach if we do only manage let's say a quarter or a fifth uh, or a, fr a smaller fraction of the entire habitat then the majority is, is going to be left and undisturbed, which allows most or a number of different species to continue their life cycle uh, undisturbed. Uh, it's inevitable that with any type of management, there will be some disturbance. We, we want to try and take approaches that reduce the, the, the amount of disturbance that some of these sensitive species are, are exposed to. So the, the biggest thing I would recommend for people to do is to divide uh, any given area of habitat into sections and only look at managing uh, one of those every year uh, so for example if we have a hedgerow we could divide that into either four sections or eight sections we have eight sections we could marry, manage two every four years and rotate them around and, and there's a, an element of you know you can be creative there and decide what's most convenient um, and the bottom line there is as well uh, just by avoiding managing the entire uh, bit of habitat in one go you're also saving on costs and time and efforts which is a, a bit of a bonus as well yeah, fab. Um, there are some questions about distribution as well. So um, do we have a distribution map uh, with areas shown 
for the breeding the breeding areas for the brown hair streets in devon uh i think we we can probably provide that yeah that, that's something i could probably i can send that to you Lindsay, and then you could distribute that to people obviously it won't be super super high resolution uh we'll need to make sure that we have the right resolution it might be sort of tetrads or uh five kilometer squares but i'll, I'll send something to Lindsay, and she can distribute that to everybody else thank um, you that'd be that great be oh, yeah and obviously um you know it's one of my aims with the saving devon's treescapes project and the data that we're collecting which will be a subset of what butterfly conservation have overall um but i would like to be able to produce some some sort of distribution maps that show year on year where our surveys have taken part have taken place so where all of you have been looking and in which of those squares we have or haven't so a sort of presence positive or, or negative presence map of Devon so I will endeavour for this season so if, let's say the season finishes at the end of March sometime after that I will endeavour to get such a map produced and I will also publish that or distribute that to to everybody involved too because I think I'd like to see that, so I hope you would too. And uh, there's another question here that links to distribution. So, is it true that butterflies are more populated in East Devon? And if so, do you know the reason why? Um, person that asked this question, Nick, lives in South Devon, South Hams, and are there any locations in that area to look for them? So, is that butterflies in general? So, the question butterflies in general or is that specific to Brown Hair Street? Let's keep it specific to Brown Hair Streets. OK, so the, I mean, the distribution of brown hair streak in Devon is quite patchy. There are some areas that we have a sort of absence of the species and we don't quite understand why that is, despite some efforts in, in surveying as well. So I live in, in Exmouth in East Devon and we don't have any records in and around Exmouth uh, leading up towards uh, along the, the um, uh, along the estuary all the way up to Exeter. We don't really have any records until we get into the centre of Exeter. And I don't quite know why that's the case, because there is a fair bit of good habitat along the way and we've got a fair bit in Exmouth that I've searched um, with no success um, and so there's lots of those sorts of patches all over the place and East Devon does have a lot of gaps uh, all the way through from Exmouth to Sidmouth there is a bit of a cavern where we don't really have any brown hair streak records despite a few people going out and surveying but as we get further over uh, towards the edge of East Devon into Dorset we do find a, a few more um, records and I suspect that it, there might be some barriers for brown hair streaks getting over there but the same applies to south devon there's a lot of similar sort of gaps and patchiness in south devon i think as you as you come south of say chudley um we get fewer and fewer records uh, as you come away from exeter there are a few around sort of tor bay uh, in that sort of area uh, particularly on the outskirts of the of the town there um and as you move on to dartmoor things become less and less um uh, less and less frequent so on the outskirts of Dartmoor, where the elevation is slightly lower, we do tend to find a, a few more brown hair streaks. Um, but yeah, it's still very, very patchy. And there's there's a, there's a heck of a lot we don't really know about its distribution. And that's why this project is really useful, because it really plugs those gaps. Um, even if we go and survey somewhere and find we didn't find any records, that's really useful mm. because, it, it you know, it's demonstrating that despite putting effort in, we're not finding them, which either says that, you know, they're not going to be there, which we can't be certain of, but it's, you know, it, it will require a certain amount of effort to find them and we just haven't meet, uh, met that threshold um but yeah i wouldn't i would recommend for people to search around you know uh newton abbott um uh, bobby tracy chudley around that sort of area there have been some records in the recent past and i'm sure there'll be some some new places around there that haven't yet been surveyed um so yeah if you if you haven't done a survey around there it'd be fantastic to try and plug some of those gaps in that area yeah, and, and from my um, observations and experience of working the last three seasons with surveyors on this project as well, um, I would say there is a particularly active uh, surveying group in East Devon. So I know that a lot of good work has happened there because of that. It it, it matched up with another um, species project that was happening in the area. So um, two for the price of one, um, and we benefited from that. So So sometimes it's a matter of surveying effort as well. Um, so I hear what you're saying about South Devon and I'd like to look, I'm always trying to look for areas where we can run some training events each year in places we haven't necessarily done before and where there are gaps as well, but where there must be some good habitat. So um, any ideas for good potential venues in South Devon and also kind of mid Devon, sort of north of Oakhampton, that area, 
I'd be interested in in somebody getting in touch and, and suggesting places to me. I'm going to pick up this next question, which is also about distribution, but James has said that an ash tree distribution list would also be useful in relation to ash dieback. If all the ash trees die out, how do we mitigate for the brown hair streaks? So there's a couple of things I want to say to that. I'm sure Max might have some comments to make as well. So yes, an ash tree distribution list could be very helpful. Um, we don't have enough trees recorded in the county full stop at the moment. And one of the things we are trying to do in the project is get more trees recorded. And they don't have to be ancient and veteran. We just call them significant trees or notable trees. Um, so there is a, a way to do that. And it's on the same recording platform as we're recording the brown hair streak. So I would just encourage everybody, if everybody on this call goes away and records one tree over the next couple of weeks, that would make a big difference to the records we've already got of trees around the county, and particularly ash trees. So please do take up that offer. Um, I put some links up earlier at the beginning of the meeting to the Devon Hedge Group, which has some useful um, information, loads of useful information, particularly on tree on hedge management. Um, my contact details are on there. The Saving Devon's Treescapes webpage uh, address is on there as well. So do have a look at some of those things for further information. Uh, what else was I going to say about, oh yeah, ash trees. So what happens to the brown hair streaks when the ash reduces or dies back? That is the million dollar question. Max, do you want to say anything on that? Yeah, I think ash trees are a bit of a concern, really. But given that brown hair streaks tend to occupy ash trees as, as master trees, historically at least, um, the, there have been observations, and I've made my own observations of them using other trees as master trees, but there is still a, a strong concern that the loss of ash trees is going to have a huge impact, uh, undoubtedly, not just on brown hair streak, but on a wide variety of other things as well. Now, I'm sure that some populations will be able to adjust and adapt, but it's in those locations that we have high densities of ash, uh, that there's nothing else that's growing through there yet, um, and we essentially lose a huge proportion of important habitat in you know in the blink of an eye really and these landscapes are changing at a very very fast rate um and it's it's quite alarming to see really i, I suspect that over time we will find that the butterfly has to adapt and, and use other trees and we don't really don't understand why it is that ash is is favored by the brown hair streak um perhaps it's got something to do with a particular type of aphid um from which the, the butterfly likes to feed as an adult from the, the honeydew that they produce but i i there's i no evidence to support that suggestion and um, there's still a lot that we we really don't understand about this butterfly um, and that's one of those things that would be really useful to 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 study at greater depth okay there's a few more questions about um the eggs and sort of relationship between distance from master trees and where the eggs might be laid so do we know much about how far a butterfly might travel from the their master ash tree to a laying location there's there's no there's no number that I could pluck out of the air, but I I would you know try and get a, a bit of habitat as close as possible to something with a reasonably sized canopy. And if they have ash trees, then that's ideal. If it's a very isolated hedge in the middle of nowhere with no trees anywhere around it, then I I would suggest it's going to be unlikely that eggs are going to be found there, unless it's a it's a female that's dispersing uh, and just happens to come across it. So it's it's about likelihood. You know if if someone says. Max, where am I most likely to find a brown hair streak egg? I would, I would not suggest a hedge in the middle of nowhere. Not to say that there won't be an egg there. It just means we're increasing our chance. Um, usually, yeah, I think it's it's really difficult. I don't really want to say a number, but mm -hmm. you know, within fifty meters, a hundred meters, it's going to be quite some distance for a female to to travel to get get to a, a hedge. So, you know, as close as possible, really. Uh, but don't quote me on 50 to 100 metres. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and and assuming that there are suitable trees and hedge in a location, do we know anything about whether they will be found in estuary areas or at the coast? Yeah, they certainly can be. Again, the, one of the key things, there's a set of criteria really that maximise your chances. You know, is it south facing? Do you have young growth? Is that young growth free of, of lichen? Um, you know, is it managed in a rotation to encourage more of more of that young growth to come through? Um, so, yes, the, I had a question come through as well, asked about how, how likely are we to find it in coastal habitats? Mm -hmm. um, 
and it, it depends on what that coastal habitat looks like. You know, if it's, it's quite sheltered, if it's sunny and exposed uh, to the sun, uh, so if it's south facing, then it increases its chance. And if there's a good proportion of blackthorn in that hedge or in that clump of scrub, then again, it increases the chances. Uh, but also it relies on a lot of other variables like how close is the nearest population. So in, in Exmouth, we've got plenty of fantastic looking habitat, but there's just no eggs to be found there. Um, and if they happen to find their way there, then I'm sure they would thrive, but it's just not, they're just not there yet. Uh, and, and I don't know why that's the case. Uh, I suggest that, I, I suppose that there may be some barriers that preventing them from getting there. So if there are huge, open, very exposed habitats, so for example, uh, Woodbury Common separates large parts of East Devon from Exeter, and that might be a bit of a barrier for some uh, for some species like the Brown Hair Street to get across because there isn't a, an awful lot of, of blackthorn in amongst uh, the heath. Um, and so that might change, um, might, that might present a, a barrier for them. But yeah, it shouldn't stop you from searching if you can find that there's blackthorn there, if it looks like it's in good condition, if it's young and, and it's got some vigour to it um, and it's not got any lichen on it and it's south facing, then these are sort of characteristics that I would recommend for somebody to search. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions about the eggs themselves. Do you, they become parasitised at all? Yeah, the caterpillars as well. Um, so there's a there's a wide range of different species that are likely to uh, parasitize uh, this butterfly, um, and so it is is probably one of the biggest causes of mortality uh, for this butterfly, given that most of the uh, most of the individuals as caterpillars are going to die and not survive. Um, so yeah, they will be parasitized by uh, by a few different types of parasitic wasp, um, and I'm sure there's a whole host of other things. It's another another area that we need to be more familiar with is the types of parasites that affect uh, some of our butterflies in the UK. But yeah, definitely a, definitely a factor. And what happens to them as they get older? Do they discolour? The adult butterflies, yeah. So they, they, they'll lose some of their wing scales. They might get some uh, nicks in the edge of their wing. Um, they will get paler in colour, so they won't be as sort of bright. So the image here, it's quite a bright orange and it will look a bit paler like towards the base of the forewing and hindwing you hear it's more of like a, a paler yellow uh, it will get paler in color over time as it gets sun bleached if it's a very sunny year uh, also they're, they're quite likely to lose this tail um on the back uh, the tails are often used to uh, to uh, distract predators so birds are more likely to strike the uh, the tails rather than the head so it's a mimic or it's suggested that it's a mimic um uh, for the antennae of the of the butterfly so they often will wiggle their two uh, hind wings to 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 move the tails and to try and distract birds so it's quite frequent that if they've been on the wing for more than a, a week that they will have lost these tails that they have at the back wow guys you really are a fan of knowledge aren't you it's good glad we invited you <laughs> um uh, talking about the eggs themselves like you mentioned that algae and lichen can grow on them and so the color might change um from that pristine white that they are to start with is what happens at the end of the season if the egg doesn't hatch for some reason will we still find it the next year and what will it look like then yeah m most i would say 99.9 .9 of the time the egg either hatches or it disappears or something predates it or sometimes or very rarely it will just fall off and so you're very unlikely to find an egg that's been there for more than a year um, very very occasionally you might find the remnants of the eggshell left from a previous year and i've only ever found a few of those uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if other people have found it as well um, and you might come across that but sometimes it's difficult to confirm whether it was a brown hair streak or whether it was something else because there's so so little of the eggshell that's left usually it's uh, just sort of the, the very 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 edge and the base of the egg that's left but it's very you're very unlikely to come across that really but yeah they, they will just either drop off or something will will consume it or it'll get knocked off by rain or whatever because over time, the, the adhesive that the butterfly produces or the adult butterfly produces um, that helps to stick it to the, the, the food plant will uh, will fall uh, or will fail and it will just fall off. OK, thank you. Um, I think we're coming to the end of the questions and time is um, running out on us as well. So that's pretty good timing, I think. But I think we've got one, else... one question. We've got a raised hand in the chat here from oh. David. OK, yeah. do you want to go for that? Catherine Baxendale, could I ask what 
effect do you think, Max, has all the heavy rains that we've had during this winter, autumn, winter, this time, will have had on the eggs? Is a heavy downpour likely to wash the eggs off or not? It's it's unlikely um, that at this at this point in time, at least, the vast majority of the eggs will still be there. Uh, it, just one heavy rain shouldn't shouldn't make such a huge impact. So I wouldn't have any concerns of of that. Um, even in heavy frost, uh, the eggs will be fine. Often the the structure of the egg itself is designed in order to deal with uh, strong weather conditions and to deal with frost. Uh, it serves as protection. So yeah, these weather conditions should they should be uh, they should be fine in this. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. And um, Paul's asked about using UV lights. Have we, has anybody done any surveys of larvae using UV light? Um, not yet. It's quite, it's relatively new. Um, and perhaps something that we could maybe arrange for another, another talk on. I could deliver a talk on that in the near future. Ooh, what a really great. good point to make. Um, the caterpillars of the, uh, the brown hair streak when they reach a certain instar. So the caterpillar's got four or five larval instars and uh, i think it's from the second larval instar on they uh, they fluoresce under ultraviolet light um, which means that it's it's quite um uh, quite an accessible way of finding the caterpillars uh, at night um, but yeah i could talk about that for about two hours so i don't want to take up too much more time but yes that's something that um, we could perhaps try and arrange for another talk on if, if that'd be useful that definitely sounds of interest thanks for suggesting that and I think I'll make this the final question. Um, Adam, who's a new surveyor this year, has been particularly active and found 36 eggs on one site. So he's been looking at the University of Exeter campus. And how does that compare to other sort of set surveys in similar areas? Any idea? Yes, yeah, difficult without knowing the, the, I guess it's about the, the size of the area that he's looking at uh, precisely and the amount of time that he's put in to do that so it's quite difficult to be precise but that sounds like a reasonable number um i think for reference one of the, the biggest uh hauls that i've ever ever had i think i counted um 120 eggs in about 40 minutes uh, along a 40 50 meter strip of blackthorn um which is remarkable i don't i don't think i've heard many people that have had that many eggs in that shorter distance in that shorter time uh, but that's something that you probably won't find anywhere else, really, or very, very rarely. Um, I think the most important thing is rather than comparing two sites to each other is is to look at the trends in time. So if uh, if Adam gets out this same time next year and repeats with the same effort along the same locations, then it'd be really useful to see whether things are changing over time. Yeah. Um, and there's, there is some value and some interest in in comparing two sites to each other. But there's so much difference between those two sites that it's really difficult to be precise about, you know, what what is it about this location that means that we've got this many eggs in, in this amount of time. But it sounds fantastic. And I, I think I've heard from Adam a few times and it sounds like he's doing a really good job there. It'd be really useful to see how he gets on in the next year, year or two. Yeah, perfect. Um, I think I, I if I haven't answered all of the questions and you have a burning question that you'd still like the answer to, then please do email me and I'll liaise with Max and we will get an answer out to you. Um, I think now it's probably an appropriate time just very quickly because we are at eight o'clock. If I can share my screen. I'm just going to show you very quickly how to go through. Our... Apologies. Let me know, Max, when you can see that screen. Yeah, all good. Wonderful. So this is the, uh, many of you will be familiar with this already, but this is the Saving Devon's Treescapes recording platform. The web address is at the top of the screen there. If you haven't used it before, the first thing you'll need to do when you go into it is go to the user info tab and just put in your name and your email address. Once you've submitted that, it should keep coming up every time you go to use the platform again. So you wouldn't need to put that in every time. For brown hair streaks, and you'll see we can also record trees here and our lichens, but for brown hair streaks, this is the form that you will fill out. There's an interactive map at the top, which will have your current location kind of in a circle. So that's where I am now in Exeter. Um, you can zoom in on this to check exactly where you are. 
The thing I would say about this interactive map is it's very useful if you are sitting at home with your laptop or if you are out in the field with this app open on your mobile phone, but with a good signal strength. Because if you don't have a good signal strength, this might not show at all, or it might show, but not actually allow you to interact with it. So just be sure um, that it is working properly before you trust what it's telling you. So I know where I am, and I know that I am in the middle of that circle there. If I am at home, but recording something that I surveyed earlier, Let's go over here. I'm going to zoom in. Let's say I was at Heavy Tree. I don't know if there was any Blackthorn there, but let's say there was. This is where I was surveying. I can change to an aerial view. I can change to an aerial view. There we are. And let's say I was surveying along this, call it a hedge line here. And I started here so I can move the, the marker to my start and end point of the survey. And that information is recorded down here. So it wants your grid reference where you started your survey and your end point. That's all very well if it's a linear hedge. But if it's a circular patch of scrub in the middle of the field, I would just put one reference in there. So I can copy that as my start point from there and paste it into there. And I can do the same with the end point. So again, I finished my survey there. That's changed. Copy that grid reference. Paste it into the end of my survey. And that length that I searched was 50 meters. The site name is Heavy Tree Playground. And the one kilometer square reference is the first two figures from each of these. So it will be SX9492. And I surveyed it today. I'm ignoring the type of habitat feature because it asks you for that down below as well. So I'm not gonna duplicate that. So it was a hedgerow and it was a field edge. So I don't need to answer non-hedgerow because those are two separate things. You don't need to tick both of them. And I'm going to say that the amount of blackthorn in that feature was dominant. It was more than 30%. So you've got a choice there. You don't have to work out precisely what percentage of blackthorn there was in your hedge. The hedge was trimmed. I'm making this up, obviously. And um, the adjacent land was improved pasture. The aspect is the obviously the, the direction, the bearing that the hedge was facing. So I'm going to say this one was south facing and I will have checked the elevation on another app that gives me elevation. Um, and I'm going to say that that was 75 meters. So just as an example, there were no signs of browsing and the area wasn't fenced. I spent 30 minutes searching and I found three eggs in total on that hedge. So we've divided the hedge into zones, A, B and C, and I found one egg in each zone. Zone A is the main hedge and the eggs are therefore above waist height. Zone B is that lower, newer growth that's suckering below waist height. And zone C is anything that's emerging a few metres away from the main hedge itself. And then in the notes section, I'm going to put more detailed notes about each one of those eggs that I found. So I'm not going to type that in now. But for example, with the here, they've got egg number one was found at a height of 75 centimetres on the blackthorn. The aspect of the egg on that hedge was south southwest. It was in zone B and there were two eggs actually found together. And then this surveyor has added some extra notes. It's just told us a little bit more about that habitat feature and that, that habitat itself. So you could put anything in here about land use, um, any other observations about the site, whether it looked like they'd been flailing in previous years, anything else that you think might be helpful to anybody who might in future be looking at this data and trying to work out what it means for our knowledge of the brown hair streets. So once you've completed as much of that as you can, you just press the click button to upload, which I'm not going to do because this is a, not a true record. Um, but that would then tell you that the record has been submitted. If you're using it on a mobile phone, just be aware that you might not see any change in that screen once you press submit. 
because the bit that will tell you it is successfully uploaded will be down a little bit on the page. So you just need to scroll down and then you'll see that and you'll have your confirmation that it's been successfully submitted. So I hope that that was a very quick voice through, but I hope that's fairly clear and straightforward and self-explanatory. This is still a relatively new app and we want, I called it an app, it's actually not a downloadable app, it's a recording platform. But we are keen always to make things as user friendly as possible. So once you start using this or if you're already using it and you've got comments or feedback, please do let me have it. Because if there's improvements that we can make, we can only do that if we know about them. Um, and we are, we're, as I say, keen to keep improving things to make your experience better. Um, on that point, so and back to Adam's point earlier about recording 36 eggs. Each survey in one kilometre grid square, we're only asking you to survey for 30 minutes and up to about 100 metres length of hedge. So we're not asking you to record every single egg that you might possibly find in that hedge. Of course, if you want to go on surveying for longer than 30 minutes or check more than one site within one kilometre grid square, that's entirely up to you. But from my point of view, I'd probably rather you moved on to another one kilometre grid square and therefore we're going to get more of the county covered rather than surveying very, very intensively within one, just one kilometre. If you can do three or four, that would be, I think, adding to our, our knowledge base. I don't know if you've got um, thoughts on that as well, Max. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no, I think that all sounds fine to me. I think that sounds great. Okay. And Paul, I noticed you've got your hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, just to say uh, on the um, elevation mm -hmm. on my GPS, it always gives it in feet and not meters. Um, oh, okay. The point of writing FT, because I wouldn't want to confuse somebody thinking of. Recording exit 200 metres. <laughs> Fair point. Yes, please. If you could make it clear, if, it, if it's not in metres, um, then yes, please do put something that makes that clear. What happens to that data at the end of the survey season is that I will get a massive spreadsheet, which is a download of everybody's survey records, um, which I will then go through and make it consistent. So the more consistent you all can be in how you record in the first place, the easier that makes that task for me, because you can imagine it's it's quite painstaking <laughs> going through hundreds of surveys and making sure everybody's recorded in minutes and everybody's put their um, aspect in the right in the same uh, format, etc. But I'm, I'm very happy to change things from feet to, to meters. There'll be a conversion for that on Google somewhere. One thing I did notice as well was the using the app. Um... Obviously, the satellite wasn't particularly accurate because I knew where I was and, and my little circle on the map was somewhere about, you know, 500 yards away. Um, yeah, that certainly can happen. So I if I if I suspect that it's not quite right, I will be checking that with something like an OS grid reference app as well or using grid reference finder when I get home. If, it, if I really think I can't identify where I am in that moment, then I will record the rest of the record when I get home. I would just just quickly add as well for your benefit, Paul, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about adding in a note about the elevation because we can get that information from uh, a grid reference or location data. We can we can obtain that information there. So it's not don't yeah. worry too much about that if uh, if it's a bit of a hassle, but it's always yeah. useful. It, it doesn't hurt to add that in if, if you've got it. I definitely seem to find them at lower altitude generally. You know, Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any other observations, Paul? Because you're a very experienced surveyor now. Is there anything you think would be useful to share with others? Or Well, I, I, I know you, you sort of said don't bother looking at flailed hedges, but um, I've found quite a lot of eggs on flailed hedges because, it, say, in the Axe Valley, which I do quite a lot of, I mean, it's the only the only blackthorn there is is in the <laughs> flailed hedges. So the Brown Hair Streets don't have a lot of choice. And, and I often find them just below where the player has sort of swiped it all off the sort of tatty edge and then just below the junction will be an egg yeah it's it's remarkable isn't it that even on flailed hedges you will find them but i guess it's you know obviously it, not as many but... no 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 of course but i think one thing to note for everybody's benefit is 
that I wouldn't shy away from surveying pretty much anywhere, even if you, you're not sure if it's suitable or not. And even if it has been flailed, if you can see something to it that, that ticks some of the boxes, you know, if there, there is Blackthorn present, even if it has been flailed, uh, as long as you can see something that, that ticks some boxes in terms of suitability, then don't be afraid of surveying that because that's really useful data for us to have. You know, we've got a lot of questions that we can answer with this data, including, you know, what sort of densities of eggs are we finding on flailed hedges? And, um, you know, so it'd be really useful to have that information. So, yeah, it's not necessary to say don't survey flailed hedges, uh, flailed hedges, but it's more of a case of you're, you're probably more yeah. likely to find them away from those flailed hedges. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, is Ruth still on the call? Because I know Ruth wanted to contribute something. If she's not, I know what it was, so I can cover. I think maybe Ruth's had to go. So Ruth in East Devon is organising a group survey um, of a landowner's farm. So the landowner is a great um, proponent of, of wildlife farming, farming for wildlife. And he's been out looking at his hedges and found something similar to Adam, I think 30 something eggs already on his hedges and has asked for some extra pairs of eyes and hands to help do a thorough survey so that he can then really understand what's where so that he can manage his hedges in the right way. And I think he probably already is, but he's keen for some help anyway. So Ruth's going to organise a little group of people to go and help there on a Saturday, probably 10th of February. I will send some information around post-meeting about that. Um, and if anybody wants to go along, if anybody who's new to surveying and wants to go along and survey with some others to just gain some experience or just is happy to lend a hand, then it will be very much appreciated. So I will forward details of that in a follow-up email to this event, probably, as I say, on Monday next week. But as for now, I'm going to say a huge thank you to Max. Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us tonight. That's been really helpful. Um, I hope everybody who's still on the call thinks the same and thinks it's been worthwhile just kind of getting together. As I say, sometimes this is a very solitary business going out and surveying, perhaps with a friend or a family member. But it's not it's not often that we can get together and, and have a discussion like this. So I think it's been really helpful it's opened up some other avenues for us to explore further. And, you know, you've got always got a connection with me. So if there's any questions that I can help with or can speak to Max about and get back to you, then I'm very happy to do that. So look out for my email next week. And um, I look forward to seeing you again in the future and happy surveying for the rest of this season that's left. We really appreciate your, your help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you.